Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. And my question is, what do these have in common? Spiritual events, transformation, karma, rebirth. Well, today's show features Robert Quicksilver, the executive producer of the Conscious Life Expo, a three-day gathering of spiritual and UFO-related tribes celebrating consciousness and offering powerful transformational sessions. Dare to Dream won the COVR Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show. Welp Magazine listed Dare to Dream with Debbie Doshinger as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. It's high ranking under Apple Podcasts for self-improvement. And we were recently notified that Dare to Dream won three Talk Radio Positive Change Awards. Thank you guys for being on this journey and helping the show get where it is. It will be almost 17 years. I've been doing the show on radio and podcast in a couple of years, and it is still my joy spot. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. If you'd like to become a facilitator or take a class, go to Dr. Dane here. H-E-E-R dot com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a media visibility specialist, and I'm a book writing coach. I show you how to take your book from inception, idea, to successfully published. I also have a company that takes authors' books to a guaranteed international best-selling status, and I do all the heavy lifting for the author. And finally, I run a boutique agency, I'm a publicist for a handful of amazing transformational folks, getting them booked on radio and podcast. If you'd like to learn how to become way more visible in what you do, and after all, that is why you came here right now with the message and the gifts you did, then allow me to give you a gift to teach you how to get there quickly. Go to debbie-inger.com slash gift. That's D-E-B-B-I, D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash gift. Well, my guest is Robert Quicksilver, executive producer who began producing the Conscious Life Expo in 2002. Robert is author of the book, 10,000 Years. Prior to producing the expo, Quicksilver was founder and director of Star Magic, a national chain of new age gift stores. He's been involved in alternative healing and metaphysics since the early 70s and often exhibited at the old Whole Life Expos. If you'd like to learn more about him and certainly about his upcoming expo, I will have the link in the show notes and to say it out loud so you can remember where to go, and I highly recommend you do, ConsciousLifeExpo.com. And with that, I very happily bring Robert Quicksilver on the show. It is so great to have you. Welcome. Hi, Debbie. How yeah. are you doing? I am so good. I'm so excited, actually, to do this. I knew you originally from afar because you put on this amazing event that I loved. And then I've come to know you in the past year and a half, which I'm very grateful for. And I treasure you. And I I am curious to start with, what possessed you? Because it's a grand idea you had to create an expo at this level. What possessed you to want to put something like this on and invite spiritual people from all over the world? Um, I don't know. I don't... Uh, I. I... I uh, um, it just came in in you know you go through your day and you don't know like bus or train or any situation so it was sometime in two thousand and two it was like a normal day and then you know do whatever I don't remember what I was doing and then this just showed up this this opportunity showed up and what the circumstances are it doesn't matter this was after the nine eleven things and the old Whole Life Expos, which had been doing this kind of work for a very long time, had kind of didn't stopped during the 9-11 stuff. This is way back 20 years ago and like that. And um, and so so um it just showed up the opportunity or the or the uh 
that 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 to do a show. And so I so I'm just um a, so a person named Shima who you may not you may know from the expo. And then there was Paul Andrews who had been doing the whole life expos for years and years, and Kenny Kaufman who'd been doing the shows up in San Francisco for years under whole life. So um so I just kind of knew these people and and it just showed up that the mark that the that the market in LA, there was a, a huge hole in the market because the old expo had gone away and nobody was doing nothing, anything. <laughs> and uh, so, so we just decided to do it. It, it just decided itself, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so my, my experience with it is that, and is that um, it's kind of a big deal and it's a big idea. And a lot of people, I can't even, I don't even think that it's like my idea even. I, I kind of want to like, it's kind of the whole consciousness of our community and I just happen to be in a, a place to be able to having a skill set to do production of things and in and having the you know the oriented towards these ideas and then and now you know I, I feel like the universe set it up what can I say it's like there's like a destiny to it I didn't try to create it it just showed up fell in my lap wow and something else had ended right before that. It was right after 9-11 and like, and and it just showed up. And so it started, it wasn't a big deal at the time when I first started it. The first year was like, you know, it was great, but you know, I was like half of the size it is now, but still it was great. And over all the years through the 2002, up for the next 20 years, right? Or something that just one year just follows the next. And And I have a sense of like, and I don't mean to overstate this, but it's like there's like a higher force that's kind of kind of there. And I'm like a, an agent for it. And I I tell you. That. Can you explain if anybody has not been to the LA Conscious Life Expo before, what would be your descriptives? What it is, what it's like? Um, comes to mind is the... Uh, like think of in the in the medieval times, those kinds of fairs where 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 I don't know how they, how they do marketing and business. They'd be like kind of trade, you know, fairs. Like think of the like a what's that called the Renaissance Fair, right? Because everyone must be familiar with that. So this is not that outside. It's not a Renaissancey thing, but it's like a fair. It's not, it's not it's not only like kind of just conference. It's not only, it's a lot of exhibitors and there's a lot of partying, you know, party partying, but like, you know, people connecting and getting together. Uh, so it's just like a, it's like a fair. And that was one of the names. I almost didn't call it Conscious Life Expo. I almost called it the Conscious Life Fair in the beginning, thinking of, of that model of the kind of the, uh, you know, middle age type model for like a Renaissance fair. But but it's not that it's not that at all. It's in a fancy hotel in Los Angeles. It's just, you know so so it's not that that crystal chandelier is kind of. <laughs> and in it, there are paradigms that are explored, such as science and spirituality and longevity, health, well-being, UFO extraterrestrials, cutting-edge metaphysics. There are people who speak all weekend long, Friday, February 9th through Monday, February 13th, 12th, <laughs> and in the LAX Hilton. And it's three floors. It's enormous. Is it actually, I don't know if this number is correct. Are there 15,000 people who walk through those doors from around the world? No, I think that's too many. I think, I think, I think if we got 10,000, that's like a lot of people. So I think over the weekend, I think, you know, it's not each day there's that many people, but over the weekend, 3,000, 4,000, you know, per day kind of thing. So I think it, you know, I, I don't really do that arithmetic to add it up. It just looks busy to me all the it's time, so like busy. crowded yeah. and busy with a lot of activity, a lot of people connecting and talking with each other and the exhibit hall, people selling all their wares and stuff and the speakers get all the rooms packed with rooms. So, so, um, yeah, so, you know, so I don't know. I don't know. I don't really measure. I don't really count that, you know, I mean, I, 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 I could. But I, it's just what what would I do with that? So it's about ten thousand people. I, what oh, what does it take people. to be you? 
for those four days. I can't imagine, you can even mention this, what you're going through right now, three weeks ahead of it, because this is launch time. And then during the actual expo, Robert, what does it take to be you? Is it very stressful? Are you managing 9 million things and people putting out fires? Are you enjoying yourself? What is it? Um, I'd say that my goal is to have it where I don't have to be there. If mm. I'm not good at what I do, then if I'm not, there, if I'm in Hawaii for the whole expo and it still functions perfect. So that's, so me being there, I don't really have a job anymore because my job is to create it. And then, you know, I mean, I'm there and I, I, you know, there's stuff to do. It's not, you know, it's not a black and white thing, but, but I, I try to have it where as though it's self-functioning. And so part of that is I have a really great staff of people that I work with them. Um, you might even, of course, you know them and they, you know, all, they're all awesome. Christine and Serena, and Michael and goes on and on Shima. So, so all these people are really great at what they do and they have this love of the work also. And, uh, and yeah, like that. So it's, it's, um, it's great working with dedicated people who are, you know, just doing their thing and, you know, being very, very, so I think it's an inspired thing. I, I didn't, I didn't like pick those, these people. It's not like, again, wow. same thing. I didn't like have an an interview and say, oh, look, we're going to hire four people. And, you know, I, you know, kind of been there, done that or in different businesses over time. But, but here it's just kind of people show up. It's, it is, I'm saying there's like a destiny to it. There's like, a, it's like a, it, people show up like, like, for example, like, um, like you, what, you know, here you are and we're working together now. I didn't like go to find you and do what you do, but you're, you've kind of somehow integrated, become have become integrated into the community of people. It's not like anyone tried to do anything. So like, but I manifested that. Oh, okay. Well, I then... did. I would sit there, Robert, for years, <laughs> like 10, 12 years ago, when I was just doing, I would interview one of your speakers now and then. That was the extent of my involvement. And I would sit in the audience and I would watch and I'd go, I want to be moderating those panels. I want to be introducing speakers. I want to be, I, that was it. It was just a thought form for me, like watching George Norrie, watching Jimmy Church, watching Alan Steinfeld and going, put me in the game coach, put me in the game. But nothing else happened except exactly as you're saying, organically, how we came together and, and started this work. I mean, I'm overjoyed. This is definitely intention put into manifestation. I think that's exactly, yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, and again, I, I wanna say it's like, I, I, I believe that um, I can make up any story about it, but I believe that there's a higher force at play bringing a community of souls together to do the work and also bringing them to the expo to have the community together, you know, with all the 10,000 people, like-minded people over a few, few days, you know, you just, you just don't get that really anywhere else. You know, and the and greatest there. speakers. I mean, uh, that's the other thing. Every year, up leveling, up leveling, as though it can't get any better. But well, some of the greatest experts in subjects that all of us listening, watching now, mm -hmm. are very interested in. And I love hearing these people. I take things from all of your speakers and workshops. Um, I can tell you, for instance, Matthew James Bailey, who will be attending. I mean, he's brilliant. He speaks about AI and he couches it in a way that everybody will learn something very important and very positive about. But he's actually changed my personal and professional life just by listening to him, wow. giving me safe tools. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, there you so go. So you that, remind, that reminds me of a story one time someone told me that. So we've been doing this a long time now, like mm -hmm. since 2002, I think. Something. And, uh, and so that was a long time ago. So, so I, I meet people now who were kids then, whose mother or father brought them to the expo in 2005. So that's 20 years later, they're, they're old, they're older, obviously, you know, adults. And, you know, and now they're coming to the expo and they're bringing their kids to the expo. So it's almost like generational that like, uh, it's a community of like individual, like-minded individuals, and not that we are all the same, not like that at all. I mean, it's a whole huge kinds of variety of people, 
but we have this one thing in common, I think that this kind of this kind of aspiration or transformational aspiration, some kind of something better out there. And I, so I don't know, so that's what I, we try to do that. You know, we try to do that. It's really yeah. great. The more I find out about you, Robert, the more cool I think you are. Wow. I I was researching you and I found out that at one time you were working to achieve your master's degree in Asian and comparative studies. Did yeah. you complete your master's in that? I I didn't present the, the uh, thesis. It's a book that I'm writing. And uh, and then, I don't know, life got, I think I got married and started having kids right in the middle of that. And it kind of ran out of time to finish it 20 or 30 years ago when I should have finished it. You know, I, I wrote a bunch of books. I think I one of them you mentioned earlier, 10,000 years. And uh, yeah, so it's like a, a book on, um, thesis is on, the law of octaves, very obscure, but if you if you know about your music theory is op octaves, but that that whole law of octaves and the and the law of seven are relate seven and eight, kind of you know beginning and ending of things, and uh, so there's a lot of the of of law, laws like universal law, the law of three and the law of seven, you know, and, and different religions have a lot of information about. That. Anyway, so that was my thesis. And uh, and I one day I'm going to finish the finish it. it. May I may not get a degree, but I'll finish the book anyway. <laughs> okay, so I'm a little bit intrigued. Then, what is the law of three? What is the law of seven? Will you share a little bit? Well, like we think of the Trinity in a, in a in a Christian sense, or or you know positive, negative, and neutralizing in terms of a talk of forces. So there's a lot of things. And, you know, we could say there's a lot of things which have four, a lot of things have, you know, that's also true. It's not like this is, but the law of three is like the part the triangle. So if you think of the law of seven and in, in like an Enneagram, you know what an Enneagram is? And it's like a circle with a kind of, uh, there are eight points and there are seven of these ditties and the triangle the fits right inside of it perfectly. It's like, so geometry and, um, you know, when God made the universe, he used geometry in some way to make it. And so these, you know, there it seems there are things that are obviously, the, you know, that Einstein figured something pretty important out. So these are the kind of laws that govern the construction of the universe. And so I was interested in numbers and how how things come. Anyway, I don't have it all in my memory. I have a whole thick book. I could bring it out and read it to you. But uh, but uh, but anyway, so. But I, I don't know that I, I, it's on my list to do that. I, I'm still working on it, and but I didn't finish that. But the institute, though, going back there, was an amazing thing. This was in the se se mid '70s, 1975. I um, I I um, had just whatever situation it was, and I came in and um, went to this school in San Francisco called the California Institute of Asian Studies, and and it, it, starting in 1975. And, and this may, it's hard, you know, this is not completely true, but I don't have it really have any memory before then. I do, I, I remember my child, it's not like I don't, but my, all the people I know in the world and all the situations I'm involved in, including my family and the work and everything stemmed out of that, um, started in 1975 when I went, started taking classes at the Institute. And um, and I started meeting. I met people there who are, who are my friends still now. And I don't know anyone from my childhood or high school or college. I, don't, I have no clue at all about that. And uh, but the people who I'm I know I I started meeting in in 1975, including uh, a man who he's passed now, who uh, named Frank Douglas, who um, founded a church called the Church of Gentle Brothers and Sisters. I'm going to tell you a story. Okay. So he, he, this guy, um, was uh, from New York, and and he had a kind of um, a, a revelation of some kind. He went to Mexico and started doing healing work in Mexico, and he was gifted with kind of healing, healing ability, where he could like touch people, and you know there are healers in the world who have this amazing ability not a mental thing it's just it's it's almost like physical almost where they through touch 
people get something. And uh, so, so anyway, so I, when I was at the Institute taking classes in, in all sorts of interesting things, um, he was a guest teacher and I met him, this was in 1975. And I, I met him and he, uh, he was, he had studied, uh, he was teaching hand, uh, doing hand analysis mm -hmm. at the time. And this was a class on all the different kinds of metaphysical tools like tarot and hand analysis or runes, or, you know, there's half a dozen different things. And there was a class about all those kinds of methodologies for cultivating intuition. Anyway, he was, um, he did hand analysis and he was a guest speaker. And I had been studying hand analysis separately on my own with someone else. Anyway, it was a connection. So after the class, we can, and I went, then the next weekend I went and I met his, his group of people who um, was the, all the ministers in his little church, which was just non-denominational thing. I'm getting to the story. So I became a minister in this church and we would go around and we all lived communally in Bolinas, which is a little beautiful spot north of, right north of San Francisco. And uh, and we and what we did, we go on weekends, we go to the different churches around San Francisco and set up shop and do do uh, readings and healings for people. So I spent a year living in this this kind of church commune, going around doing healing work and reading hands and stuff. Uh, to you know, finding out what people need, what kind of healing they need. You know, you could tell a lot from a hand, you know, um, you know, and once, and once people open up, they just tell you, you know, what's, what's going on. So anyway, so that was really great. And so now all the people I know in the world, I know from that, group, like uh, I married one of the ministers and had a whole family. My kids became ordained and I, you know, not, not the expo people now so much, but uh, the uh, other kind of personal friends and stuff. And um, anyway, so, um, yeah, and uh, anyway, so that that was that's how that happened, and and so so that's how I'd gotten. You didn't ask, but I'll tell you, that's how I'd gotten the name Quicksilver. It was an ordained when I became ordained. That was each of the ministers when they became ordained. There were about thirty of us at one point. Became what they all got a new name in the ordination. So. Um, like that, and uh, so I was. My name was Robert. Was my kind of birth name, and so they. I, I had. I'd written a po I'd written this long, um, epic poem called "The Legend of Quicksilver," which I you haven't seen. No. And it's about it's about a, um, a it's it's pretty long. It's probably forty pages long or something, and it's about like a. Remember the rhyme of the ancient mariner or something like that it was a long poem like that but this was about a guy had a spaceship and he's traveled around the universe and he lands on different planets for different times and then he landed on earth and you know and then had the experiences of the earth experience which are not always so great you know comes in, up and down is our experience here and uh you know but then he worked through his stuff anyway so it was and but, but then and that and then the whole time he was on earth he didn't know his name but then he met a girl girl at the end of the poem who who uh, who, who knew his name and told him finally what his name was. <laughs> oh and, that's no, just I'll, I'll show that to you you'll enjoy that poem I'll, I'll make a note I'll send it to you I have it it's digital I'll send you you know I wondered because you have an amazing name right it's yeah. sort of it's got charisma and some stardom to it. And it's like a name, somebody should be doing something like the Conscious Life Expo. Right. <laughs> and here there's actually a story behind it. And it I is. love the fact that you kept the name. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it's a, it, uh, I think of it as not a trade name, you know, because there's a part of it has to, I have to take, be responsible for being who I am also. But but I, I see what you say. You know, it's true. It's a, like a marketing thing where it's kind of easily recognizable and and like that. So I, I use it that way. And uh, when I was in a straight business before I started doing expos in two thousand and two, I was in a. I spent my adult life um, in manufacturing. Where I manufactured furniture, commercial furniture. That's what I did: glass furniture, glass furniture, furniture, and. And in that business, you didn't want to have, you just wanted to be kind of really normal, like, you know, like really Tom, Tom Jones or something, you know, and so I couldn't really use my, 
I had to wear suits and stuff and not like, oh, no. <laughs> no, but anyway, not the point. So, um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so it became a kind of a name to use it for the expo. It's perfect. Yeah. Perfect. And what about puzzles? Because we had lunch one time and you were working on your own creation, which I thought was phenomenal. I know puzzles are so good for all of us to do. It's really good to keep your brain healthy and active. So you create your own, I think, crossword puzzles. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, crossword puzzle. I, I, I you know, I kind of like to do crossword puzzles I mean, during lunch or something. It's fun to kind of just do that or, you know, sometimes for a break, but I started make, doing my own, making my own crossword puzzles and I made did a book of crossword puzzles. Um, I only did five, so it's, but it still took a whole book. And I'll, it's real, making a crossword puzzle was the hardest thing. Uh, Cause in, in crossword puzzles, if you've done them, there's, you know, there's a lot of stupid words that people will use. And I was like, it, that pisses me off. So I would, so I, did, I couldn't do it. So I had to use, I had to really beat up the puzzle and make it so that it was really coherent that all the words had weren't just arbitrary made up stupid words, which in crossword puzzles, you get a lot of that. I don't know if you do crossword puzzles. Or not. Yeah, my mom but, was huge into that. She was big into the New York Times crossword yeah, puzzles. Yeah, that, that's I, way too hard for me. <laughs> I mean, all of that, that connecting and going across and this word has to match all of this and all, it's mm -hmm. like, it's, it's a labyrinth of words. Right. So, so then so then you can vi visualize a crossword puzzle. I guess I could find a book and show it to you. But the, you know how all the little black squares are all lined up next to each other in a certain mm, geometric pattern and they were kind of one, they kind of mirror imaging each other everywhere. Mm -hmm. I, okay, so I, I abandoned that and I started making designs on the page with the boxes. So I did a puzzle on Buddhism just using only Buddhist words. Oh, cool. And so and instead of having the bo the black boxes, I made the black the black boxes on the grid, an empty grid. I put the and I made the shape of a Buddha. Hmm. Right? You can visualize so Buddha, sitting Buddha image, right? And imagine that was dark. And then the, anyway, whatever it was. And so those are all Buddhist words. And then okay. I I did one on uh, Hindu words only. Mm. I studied all that stuff at the institute, and then I did um, one on all Hebrew, on Jewish words. On on on, uh, I'll send that one to you, and that was and that, and that visually was a Jewish star. Oh. Was you could visualize the boxes creating the image of of a star of a six pointed star, wow. and so all the words were related to that concept. Well, that it's, it's I'll send you the book. I'll send you the book. <laughs> If I if I get if I figure it out, I should get something because I'm sure they're difficult. They're really, um, I can't even do them. If I go back now, I wouldn't be able to do them without wow. looking looking at the answers. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's so creative. Yeah, it's a perfect segue because I want to talk to you first about karma, and then about rebirth. I want to ask you just at the top, Robert. How do you define? karma and in your definition of karma how does it influence or shape our actions and our experiences in life okay i think that's a really important question and uh, so uh karma is really really simple it's the law of action and reaction i think that's we understand you kind of you know you, we see it in our, in our world every day you push something and it moves or you know, there's all the situations where we create situations and there are re uh, consequences to our situ the situation. So if we go into a situation with anger and blah, 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 we're going to, what we're not, we're not going to get a good healing result out of that. We're going to get more anger out of that. We're going to get a consequence of anger, which is not healing, which is just more, more whatever, not stuff. So, so once you once you once you believe know and really believe that your actions have consequences, that you're not just like it's not without consequences. So they all have consequences. When we meet a stranger walking down the street, and um, okay, that's not a good example, but um, say with someone we care about. So if, so if, if they say something and you know, and I could choose to be angry. And maybe maybe that's a hard. It's hard with in, in interpersonal situations where it's really hard 
to watch our feelings and emotions. But I, but, but once we get, we get, so we understand that if I project onto my partner anger, that's not going to get me love, <laughs> you know? So like, so, so, so it's, it's learning that the consequences of our words and our actions have impact. And if we, so if we want to have a, a shitty life and a shitty world, we should go about hitting people and banging on people's heads and throwing bombs at them. And then we'll get that consequence. If we want to have a, a, a loving world where there's peace and harmony and people are happy, then we have to bring those kinds of elements into our lives. And um, so I think that's the law of karma is, is that there are consequences to our actions. It's, it's, it, you know, there's no, I don't think there's anyone watching that. I think it's just like a law that happens that you, you know, gravity, it's like a law, like it just happens. Like there are consequences to our actions and we may not be able to see them always in the moment, but in the long haul, that has to be, it has to add up that way. It only add up that way. Same thing with, with birth and death. When we are having a life and we have a life of where we do, we try to do good work and, and, and this is mostly true for most people, you know, trying to do good things and not, you know, be, be ridiculous. And, and, um, and then, so then, then you, you know, then the rebirth, then, then there's again, the law of karma, it's, it, it, it goes over a lot. It's not just one lifetime because it's not enough time to, not enough time to have all the consequences of our actions, so to speak. And so, so it, it, you know, when you think of like um, multiple lifetimes and then the different kind of patterns we establish in one lifetime, we create the, we become the causes for the consequences in the future. So if we live, live you know, a few lifetimes doing good work, then we can expect, or the law is that the future life consequence will be good. I mean, I've got a question for you. Very Buddhist, really. That's so, exactly it's really very Buddhist. Uh, you know, I Buddhist. understand what you're saying very much. And I'd like to think that most of us live our lives understanding that exactly. we want to do right for the right reasons. And we want to do right. I mean, this is something that comes into my consciousness a lot. I think, what would I want? You know, um, what would I want? Like, like, for instance, last year, my mother died. We had a dog died. And I felt so beautiful about the experiences, difficult, painful experiences, but also quite beautiful because of the way I chose to show up for these, the dog and the human at the end of their life and the things I was able to do and facilitate. That felt like amazing. So it wasn't as much about karma in my thoughts, but it was my, the last days, the last breaths I take, I want to be surrounded by love and goodness and be ushered into the light in a way that is very, a very graceful transformation. So I did it for those reasons. And I'm thinking, as you say this, that because life is multidimensional. So this is going to be a little complicated, but it's thought provoking. If life is multidimensional and what you're saying that what I do, what anybody does invokes, can invoke good and bad, can influence another life. But what about when life's lives are happening concurrently? So my soul is alive here and on this planet and in this other country and in this alternate earth and so forth. How how does that work karmically? Sounds pretty complicated to me. I, I have no idea. I, I have enough trouble just dealing with this this little creature here. <laughs> you know, I have no idea. <laughs> it would be a good question to ask when we cross oh, over, okay. that's for sure. Yeah, so what sure. about different interpretations of karma across different cultures or belief systems? Are you aware of those? Um um, I, I think that different, everyone has to have a, some rule, like, you know, the law of change is, you know, talk about laws, the law of, not the law of change, but the, the, this um, causes and consequences. It, it's got to be true for everybody. It, it seems like a universal thing. I don't think it's just like particular to one religion or, you know, psychological study or another. It's, it seems like a, you know, I mean, gravity is, is not, you know, specific to anything. It's just gravity. So this this is the same thing, but then I would add to that another thing that's that's 
that um, so so the other half of the conversation karma is is um, how to create good karma. And so then we so then we have to be we, so in order to do that and to try to create good karma or karma or actions that would result in positive effects, whether in the immediate future, in the few years future or another lifetime future, whatever it might be, or then we, we understand what we what we're taught and what we learn is that we have to um, you, you know come um, we have to um, in, increase our capacity to love and to forgive. A lot of it is forgiveness. And once we are able to forgive and, and allow uh, us, allow ourselves to love, um, I think that's, that, that's, the, that's the actions that we have to take to, to begin to create good karma. Mm -hmm. Not doing bad karma, not be doing stupid things, and the other one is do, being proactive, doing positive things, or like, you know, like for you know, like say if you say someone hurt your feelings, you know, and like, and you know, I, we all get our feelings hurt. It's easy to do, and and but you know, we don't want to react to that. Okay, so we don't want to take negative, but then we also want to forgive the person who did that to us. Maybe they had a bad day, or they, who knows, whatever it is. You know, they're not really trying to hurt me. Why would anyone want to do that? You know, even if they are, too bad. You know, but so I still can send them forgiveness and and hard energy. So that's hard to do when we think we look at the world and all the idiots running the world. How do we how do we send love to some of these idiots running the world? And it's a challenge. It's not so easy. And um, but I think that's the, that's the way forward. Is like that sending you know not manifesting negative energy and manifesting positive energy. Yeah. I think those, that's, the, so I was answering the question on karma, I think, yeah. and, 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 and past lifetimes and stuff. So I think, yeah, I think, you know, like that, I think that's what it is. Let, so here's something I do, and then let me know if you have a personal story or experience you can share. So for instance, we both live in Los Angeles. And everybody knows it comes with traffic, sometimes crazy drivers. So if, for instance, I am driving behind somebody <laughs> who's driving in a way that maybe it impacts me, right? I'll just say that maybe it impacts me. It could be erratic driving. It could be slow driving. It could be like changing lanes a little crazy. I, years ago, made a decision instead of reacting that I pretended the person behind the wheel was pregnant and had to get to the hospital right away, or it was the beloved of that pregnant person driving like crazy to get there. And so I just back off and get out of the way and I bless them, you know, get where you're going safely. And so I think that's kind of a good thing I do yeah, that I don't a, incur that's negative that's karma. That's exactly the example of it, you know, because we don't know that person's circumstance and, and maybe right. they're, maybe they're, you know, who knows, you know, and like, but not to interact with it, but to send them good energy like that. I had a teacher one time who every time she heard like a fire engine, she stopped and, you know, and you hear fire engines all the time in a city, you know, so she would, you know, it was something that she just picked up on and she would stop and just send energy to the, wherever she was sending it to, you know, and, and uh, I think I, you know, I mean, you have to be pretty sensitive and in the moment to do that. So a lot of it is really, I think, part of the practice of of sending positive energy, creating is is being able to be present in the moment to our thoughts, because the thoughts, you know, come in, you know, they just kind of take us and run, run, run our lives. Mm -hmm. But we have to learn how to be present and to not so much choose the thoughts. I mean, thoughts are coming at one, you know, at a million miles an hour and but we get to kind of discriminate in some way and choose some part of that, that so we don't have to therefore be subject. If we have a negative thought, we don't have to therefore take action on it. We could like, okay, watch it, move on. And then, you know, and then wow. try to fill, try to have positive thoughts and reinforce those. So in a meditation, we find 
an object and say someone we don't like and we purposely send love to them as an example of trying to to work the balance of the energy so that's beautiful these are great examples i'm going to absolutely incorporate this one with the fire siren i years decades ago when i first um, was reading all sorts of books you know i've been into metaphysics since i was born really yeah, i bet you know in my family books were the gift growing up and i remember being this like toddler and where my mom would say come on it's valentine's day you know you and your brother are going to get a book and i'd be like tarot <laughs> astrology <laughs> and that's the stuff i was into and so I remember reading books about NDEs, near-death experiences, and always, if, if it involved, let's say, a car accident, and that person had risen above their body, ostensibly were on their way to death until before they completely went into the light, they were offered another choice. But they were aware, visually, of what was going on down below in the car crash, the other people involved, anyone who showed up to help them. And somehow that put something in my mind. You know, that's a really scary situation to be in a car accident. And so I know, again, in LA, you know, there's a lot of looky-loos. If there's somebody, something happening off the side of a freeway and everybody's looking at the a car crash or an accident, and that is the moment I immediately send love and angels and safety and may everybody be well. I know that's what I would want. And so I really also like these examples you gave Robert about the fire siren, uh, fire siren and sending love so and safety. Siren, something, anything like that. Yeah. And also the meditation. You know, and that's probably the more difficult one if somebody you feel has really betrayed you or taken something or stolen or hurt or <laughs> is trying to run for president again. <laughs> <I'll> just, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it can really trigger people. <laughs> no, totally. So forgiveness is like a big deal. And, uh, and, you know, you have to really work at it. You have to work at forgiveness and it doesn't come, oh, I forgive you. And, but there's layers of it and there's deep, mm -hmm. deep, you know, there's, it goes deeper and, you know, some of the stuff people we have to forgive, we've had lifetimes of experience. So it's not like we could resolve it so quickly. It's just an ongoing, we just have to maintain our presence in, in the love energy because we don't know all the people we're meeting and situations are arising. So we don't really know. And mm -hmm. so I think, I think finally it just, it comes down to just not even thinking about all the different things, but just manifesting um, through your heart as much as possible in interacting with people and um you know on and, and you know and, and not yeah and then forgiving people all the stuff that we do to each other and th i think that'll help a lot in personal stuff i don't know <laughs> that that's what i've come to <laughs> yeah because also sometimes really crappy things that happen to us point us in a different direction or force us to go into a very deep healing experience. And when we come out on the other side, you've often heard people say, I never thought I'd say this, but I'm really grateful that happened. I'd never be who I am today. I'd never be where I am today if I didn't go through that. Absolutely. So, so that just proves that the, the surrendering to like the mm. entity, like the, our guides, you know, that are just kind of helping inform our consciousness about things and you know to, to, okay i'm going to take this i'm going to turn the corner here today instead of going to the next block to turn the corner and then it turns out you turn the corner that day and you meet someone you some situation you meet someone so we don't really know a lot of this is not that it's programmed but like but we have like i think we have like a higher mind that is more aware of the interconnectedness of situations and people and we just have to you know be quiet enough in our thoughts or just not be obsessed with them so much and just not even listen for it. It just, al just allow it to influence us. And so, so that's what the expo is like. It's, uh, you know, it's like more than I could do as like a person and it really is. And like mm -hmm. even the whole team of people, you know, but, but it just something, some, some higher force, uh, I, I believe it's really some comes into the whole energy field and, 
not that it does anything specific, it just allows a more comprehensive understanding or connections between people or, or something. It doesn't do anything. It just allows certain things to manifest inside its, its higher level of consciousness. I love that. That makes sense. Something like that. Yeah, I really, I really love that. It's like you know, you set up the matrix, and it operates at such a high level and vibration. I mean, the intention is absolutely beautiful, and who it attracts is absolutely beautiful. And then the right people. I mean, you mentioned your team before. I was even going to ask, but you got there first. I don't even understand how you have some of those people, you know, Christine alone, like to me, she's a goddess to be as calm as always on top of everything. She treats everybody with kindness and, you know, deep connection. I think the world of her. And so I know also Serena and Seema and your son, Michael, who's brilliant. Like it's true. The fact that these people fully come on board. So that's really good karma, right? Really good karma. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really good karma. So, so, and so, so I have to assume therefore that all these individuals with each other have had previous lifetimes of experience. Interesting. Yeah. Doing good work and interacting with each other in different ways, different relationships, you know, all the ways that we can be born in the same lifetime. Uh, you know, it's not always the same uh, um, archetype of person. It's always, we do all, all of it. And, and so I think that, so, yeah, so I, I believe that all these people are kind of from the same tri a tribe of people that are just been trained to do this work. Mm. So... so this concept of reincarnation, rebirth, right, is tied to the idea of karma. And how do those two concepts interact? What role does karma play in determining the circumstances of one's rebirth? Fair enough. Um, that comes to mind is, is answer, to answer it this way. When we die, when we die, um, do we have any desire left in our mind, in our mind, in our consciousness? If we have desire, if we want to like, if we, you know, want to go, whatever it is, all the million zillion kinds of desires that humans have, if we still want to like have life, we, we find another body, the soul finds another body. Um, I, I believe that, I believe that. And then through that experience, through the, I don't know if this is answering your question, but it comes to mind. So through the all the body, one lifetime after another, boom, 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 boom. In 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 the East, they think of thousands and thousands of lifetimes, you know. And here in the West, we, you know, we think maybe a few hundred, you know, since the 16th century or something, or whatever. But um, but uh, so over the over the thousands of lifetimes, um, um, we 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 grow. Hopefully, we grow. We we learn from our experiences, and this is what the book Ten Thousand Years is about. The one I mentioned is about. So it's, that's the story of us three souls that get born into the same uh, over ten thousand years, starting from like ten thousand BC to the present, or something like that, more or less. And where they get born in the same lifetime in different relationships. And there's this, you know, their family and then their business people and then their, their enemies and their lovers and their, you know, their, and their mothers and fathers and all the million types of ways that we relate to each other. So these three characters get born over the 10,000 years and all the multiplicity of, of relationship with people. And they... And then they start off very crude in the 10,000 BC. They're just, you know, we're just hunters and gatherers and just trying to kind of, you know, protect our territory, you know, and then, and then the, the characters go through lifetimes of like doing bad things, hurting each other and, you know, and doing all sorts of things. And then they learn from their experiences. And by the, towards the end of the book, they grow up a little bit, you know, get, you get more like spiritually mature over having had all the, 
crappy experiences. And then in, in between the chapters, after they die in that particular chapter, they kind of go back into the other world, you know, kind of re re-examine all this stuff and then figure out what kinds of bodies they're going to have and what kinds of lessons. And, and then they, and anyway, they go through and then they come out and they come out the other side after the, at the end of the book, they're kind of more easily for, forgiving each other for stuff, you know, and then whatever betrayals that they have committed to each other, all resolve that out or forgiving each other for it. And, uh, and, um, and so that's what, so that's, it's a story, it's a story of evolution of these three characters in, in, and in, and each chapter is in a different location. It starts off in the caves and I think it goes to China and then the Middle East somewhere and then Europe and then it comes across into America. And I think, the, so it's a kind of a movement of energy across around the globe as the evolution of the planet has taken place. And here now, the, the next to the last chapter is America, I remember. And then the last chapter is Pacific. So there's, you know, still moving towards a, a, a future destiny. You know, it's not, it's, you know, we're just kind of in the middle of it. It's not over yet. And uh, anyway, so, and and yeah, so then there's the, all the different angels that help them get through stuff. And, and it's part of God's master plan that humans come into this earth plane of existed three-dimensional plane. We go through all our shit, hopefully come out the other side, more loving, more able to do the and um and that's and that's what I that's what I think it's about. Amazing. Okay. And, that, and is your book cool. now is your now is ten thousand years is that available on Amazon? Yes, yeah, in Amazon. Yeah, I think it's available. Yeah, it's available. I don't promote it or anything. I was satisfied. You know, I had to write it. I, it took like a long time to write, but I had to. I wrote it and and I had to write it and and I got a. I, you know, um, I just published it. So, and I feel like I wrote the book because it's on Amazon in a book form and it's an actual book with a cover and, you know, this and that. And, uh, and it is been number. <laughs> ISBN number. Gotta have one of those. So I important. So anyway, so, um, but, but I've, I haven't really tried to sell it. Uh, I haven't really tried to, it hasn't come up into my world to try to sell it or market it. You know, I was what do you, so what do you do every day, Robert? What do you do every day that is a practice or a ritual that keeps you feeling grounded or centered in order to do all of what you do? Um, I, uh, I don't know. I, I, um, you know, I, 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 I uh, over the, I don't really have like a formal practice to sit in one place for an hour or two hours, you know, been there and done that, but, but it's not really my thing. When, when I was younger, when I, when I, um, I, I uh, remember what I mentioned, I met, went to the Institute. So I met a, a, some people there who were Buddhist, Buddhist community. And I became involved with that community. I actually became a Buddhist monk, a monk. Wow. You know, a monk in brown robes. I mean, you think of the Asian Buddhists who are all wearing their, you know, robes and stuff. But Shave I was head in everything. The whole thing, yeah. I'm wow. shaving my head. So anyway, but I was a very bad monk. <laughs> I was a very bad monk. I loved all these people. You know, I fed them and I contributed to the, the monastery and everything like that. But I didn't want to be a monk. I wanted to be in the kitchen with the girls. <laughs> this is okay, this is a true story. They were all cooking for the monks. That's in that society. The monks are, you know, and they don't do anything. They pray and, and bless. Good, good for them. That's great. But they don't really do any work. They, you know, they 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 pray and and, and meditate. And that's powerful. I don't mean to do, make it any less than that. But the the women do all the work. And so they feed the monks. So also we had the, when I was there at that time, there was, I don't know, say 10 monks at the monastery. And I didn't really want to be a monk. And I just wanted to be in the kitchen prepare, helping the, the girls who were my friends, the nuns, basically. They were nuns. Who were they? They were nuns. They weren't like girls. They were, they were nuns. But these were my friends. At, at that, These were my friends. And uh, I just wanted to be there helping cook. 
that's what, and I don't know, that's kind of, I, I look back on that. So I, so anyway, I think of myself as I was a very bad monk. I, it, I was supposed <laughs> to, I took the gas for like a week and after two or three days in the forest alone, I just couldn't handle it. I just wanted to go to the kitchen. <laughs> and not that I wanted to eat, I just wanted to be with my friends, the nuns, and and help make the food for the monks. What did they want you to do in the forest? I just sit in, sit in your- Like contemplate? Yeah, meditate, yeah, meditate, basically. Pretty hard for me. Yeah, and you know, I, 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 you know, a little bit was good, but like a week was like, you know, by the third day, I was like out of my mind. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. <laughs> and you know, and I see that it's not my thing. I'm, I'm like in a world of action. There are people who are born their astrology or their karma, whatever, and they're, they're, they have a meditative soul or personality that's easy for them to go and do that. I, you know, for me, I, I, I am an action and. You know, I'm creating things, and uh, so that's so that's you know, I want to feed people. That's what I want to do. I don't want someone to feed me. I want to feed other people. Oh my God, that is so hilarious, bad monk. You know, <laughs> I just came back three weeks in Italy, and one of the things I did while I was there is I went to a very sacred site, which is the burial for Padre Pio. Padre Pio was a monk. And um, he did many beautiful things. In fact, he was a monk. Um, people used to laugh at him because he used to say, I'm the reincarnation, the rebirth of the donkey of Jesus. <laughs> people would be like, but really, he had these deep connections to that. And he would talk about other planets. He would speak galactically at a time when nobody did. But his new miracle, the miracle that goes on is the fact that he died as of right now with you and me 56 years ago. And they put him in this glass encasement and he lays there today in his monk robe and his face is perfect. It's impossible. No embalming, nothing, not a crease, not a wrinkle, not a decay. He's perfect. And I, I was at an ashram while I was there for two weeks with a Swami, which was a, a new and very wonderful experience for me. And I asked the Swami because he actually, he had had some miraculous interactions with this Padre Pio. And I asked him, but why, why? I understand that it's amazing to look at him and he's unchanged, but truly why? What is the purpose? And he said, Padre Pio chose that he would remain here, that his soul would remain here so that when we visit, he will do miracles for us. So I thought this is what an amazing opportunity. <laughs> Um, there was a practice of walking all around. It's it's gated, but you can see very well all angles of him in this encasement. And I took this as an opportunity to pray and ask for things. And, and after I was done, I thought, I had this really cosmic experience because I thought, oh, you know what? I'm going to pray for the happiness of everybody who's in this room right now coming to visit him that they have magic and miracles beyond their wildest dreams. And then I thought, oh, I want to pray for, and this is the, I haven't shared this with anyone. I'm going to pray for everybody because the building is huge. It's got a museum and amazing church. And I said, I'm going to pray for everybody here. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to pray for everyone in Italy to have magic and miracles. Okay, everyone on the earth. It just kept <laughs> extending Wonderful. and i thought this feels so good right now yeah, totally. to wish this for people feels good listening to you say that yeah it was a, it was a really pleasant experience and i don't know if that was induced by the fact that he was there and his magic was there but whatever it was it was a really lovely to want that for everybody because uh, exponentially I started realizing, do you know, and it really harkens back to the conversation we're having. If everybody had this, if I could wish happiness and health and magic and miracles for individuals I will never meet, they might be happy. There might not be war. There might be people who stop and do things for one another and create beautiful karma and have a different life and create different lives for other people. And it just was like, oh, this is so right. This is so good. Yeah, I think that's really, that's a really big difference between the Eastern religion and the Western religion, I think. Like, for example, what you said, where I think in the East, 
um, <clears throat> you, you kind of do things like um, you, you share the merits is an example where so so you go through your day or we go through our days and we accumulate good energy. So sharing the merits is uh, is where you take that and you say just kind of what you said, whatever, and I think the actual words could be something like whatever merits we might gain today be shared with all of the beings around us, with all the sentient beings or all the whatever beings you want. And, and it's really just taking the energy, the good energy and throwing it out into the universe. So it's not just keeping that I'm feeling good, but taking my my good energy and pr projecting it onto people and you know people we like and people we don't like in a, in a non discriminating way. Um, there was a teacher that came out of Tibet named um, Kalu Rinpoche. Mm -hmm. He he was this from the eighties, long time ago now, and uh, and he said something that's really kind of made a made a difference in in my in my world. Maybe it was the seventies. He said. He said that the fat the, the fastest way to enlightenment. Now I, I don't you know. Then this was a, a guy who who was a senior Tibetan monk, and enlightenment was something that he knew about. You know, I mean that's what they that's the world that they they think about is what what is that nirvana. So he said the fastest way to do that is to to say uh, to have a prayer where where you bless all you you basically just take your good energy and you bless all the people in the universe. And then you, so you just, sh you just, the same thing like sharing the merits, but it's more proactive. It's like not sharing the good results, but actually actively sending hot, good energy, loving, kind, loving energy. And then so you, in a, in a, to all the, you know, on all the different beings in the universe to, and you, you can get, you could parse it pretty, pretty finely to all the beings I like, to all the beings I don't like to all the beings who have green hair, you know, or to all the beings who are tiny, to all the beings who are hurt. And you could really begin to, to define areas of life where you are taking your energy and you're expressing kind and loving energy towards that specific area of life, like your family. So you think of like, you, you, you know, you think of your, your siblings and you just get them as, and you just send them, you know, you just, in your mind, you bring them into your mind and you extend love to them. So, and so this is like, he, he thought that was the uh, fastest way to, um, to, uh, to enlightenment, this Kyle Rinpoche, that by uh, first um, extending, you know, your good energy to other people and then sharing the merits of all of that with all the other people. And it was, uh, I believe him, he knew. Uh, uh, um, I believed him. I did. I believed him. And uh, so I would say if, if you wanted to, that's I think the singular thing that I do that's consistent is like, like, is I have that thought and that mental process in my mind pretty much all the time about extending love towards other people, you know, people on the street, you meet good people, bad people, whatever it might be, or people I work with or you know, people I like, people I don't like, you know, all my, all the million kinds of things. And then, and then sharing the merit with, um, yeah, with, 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 to, with those people. There was another great teacher, uh, you may, she's still alive. Um, um, uh, I can't think of her name. Um, anyway, who is a Buddhist teacher who says the same thing. She lives up in. Yeah. Is it Pema? Pema, Pema yeah. children. You, if you listen to Pema, do you listen to Pema? Yeah. Listen to her CDs. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Yeah. So whatever, whatever she says, seems right. <laughs> seems right to me. I think that's the way. To... Yeah. Well, sorry to the monks. They didn't get you after all. But <laughs> I think we're so lucky to have you. What are you looking forward to? with Conscious Life Expo this year? Oh my God, this year, um, well, uh, it's, it's, it's a miracle, you know, it's a miracle. And so I'm just like, I'm happy, I'm like lucky, happy to be like part of a miracle, you know? So what am I looking forward to? Um, uh, 
you know, I'm already thinking about the, the expo after this one. So I'm not really, I'm not really thinking about 20, uh, 20, 2025. So what do I want from this one? I want everyone to have a good time. And, you know, I want all the things to work and no kind of weird things. And, you know, and like everyone to like have, you know, have a, have a, have a good time with it. And, 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 you know, where they, and a lot of people come and they meet their new partners because the whole community is all kind of like mine it a little bit and so you could you know it's like you meet people and you already have things to talk about well because you already have a common bond so i hear stories all the time where people met their partners at the expo and 10 years later they've been married for a few years kind of thing and you know i, I love those stories i know a woman really who wants to volunteer for the conscious life expo <laughs> And I, I also know she was going through a breakup and I got this download when she said that, like, oh my God, you're going to meet someone there. And then she said it out loud. She said, I have this feeling I'm going to meet a man there. And yeah. I thought that is, that's two of us. That feels really good. So happen. I want to give people an overview quickly. And by the way, again, the link is going to be in the show notes, consciouslifeexpo.com. Here's some of who is speaking Daryl Anka, who channels Bashar, Elizabeth April, Linda Moulton Howe, Deborah King, Nick Pope, Andrew Collins, Matthew James Bailey, Twin Ray, Althea Lucrezia, Shaman Durek, Carolyn Corey, Adam Apollo, William Henry, Daniel Sheehan. Most of these people have been on the show over the years and they're phenomenal. Sarah Breskman Cosme, Vivian Chavez, Del Bigtree, Whitley Strieber, Matthew yeah. LaCroix, Rick yeah. Levine. Yeah. I could go on, Brad Olson. Oh, great. Dan, um, I could you go mentioned on. Daniel Brinkley. Danian Brinkley, Daniel Jason Brinkley. Shirka. Oh, my God. The list is amazing. Maureen St. Germain. Jumpsy. Marine Saint Germain, JJ and uh, doctors JJ and Desiree Hertak. I was in uh, Mexico City speaking with them, and also oh. went to the pyramids with them. Of course, yeah. the amazing Alan Steinfeld will be there. George Nori will be there. Uh, mm -hmm. Jimmy Church will be there. Sarah Adams will be there. I mean, go on the site. Really, it's too extensive to read all of these names to you. This star transformation list maria M martinez amy robeson uh jerry Sargent. it goes on and on and on in most beautiful pictures stephen bassett etc arcturus Ra, etc and i am moderating the et origins panel on saturday at 2 30 please cool. come and join us please come and say hi last year people came up and said i'm here because of you and the show and i heard about this event please come up and say hi to me i want to meet you and my dear robert quicksilver this is dare to dream what do you next dare to dream what are your future dreams and goals um my future dreams and goals okay that's fair uh i uh i want to um after the expo, because all I do now is just work at, the, you know, working on expo, you know, full time right now, obviously. But after the expo, I have a few months, I think I'm going to try to clean up one of the books I'm writing. I've, I've written like six books, you know, which I don't tell you, know, including the one I mentioned, a couple mentioned, and then crossword, but I have another one I'm writing. And, and uh, so, so I think I'm going to write, I, I don't really like to go anywhere, you know, I, I, I could have gone like, anywhere in the world, Egypt, like when I was working with the, with the monks, I could have gone to Asia any time. I don't know. I just, I, I don't know. I kind of feel like I've been there, done that, you know? And like, so I just, I like to stay home and, um, and I don't really go any, anywhere. It's a little pathetic. I wish I, wish I was more <laughs> ambitious, <laughs> but, uh, but um, um, I don't know, like uh, all my friends that were taking trips to Egypt and, boat boat cruises and you know I, I'm, they'd be happy if i went on i don't i never do anything like that and, uh, i don't know i just kind of i like to i like to just be quiet a lot and 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 read and write and but now i saw actually i started working out at the gym a little bit thinking that that's a good idea so mm -hmm. i i do like three minutes every other day on it three minutes you're 
Three. <laughs> That's the least amount I could do. So three minutes. <laughs> Well, that's fine. Uh, anyway, the day goes by, you know. Oh, I know I started uh, before this last expo, I started taking ceramics classes. So I think coming up now, I think I'm going to go back and and I got a whole ceramic set up with clay and the whole thing. And so I'm going to start, maybe I'll start making some of the sculptures I've been wanting to make. I like to build things. So that's what, I think that's what I'll do pretty much. I, I'm like, I'm like a retired person, you know, I'm like, I'm, you didn't ask me how old I was. You asked me how old I am. Um, okay. I never do. But how old are you? 75. Unbelievable. You're my yeah. inspiration. You really, you stuff. are. I'm like retired, so I don't really have to do anything. But you're like retired, not retired. But you're yeah. retired doing what you love. Yeah. And exactly. you're retired and contributing, right, to society and mm -hmm. to the world at large. So I'm grateful. And- I'm grateful to know you and thank you so much, Robert, for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing all of that with us today. I'd like to be open with you. All right. I hope that worked out for your show. Okay. And uh, okay. So um, so we should have a call and go over your expo type stuff. I, I need your rooms and the different things. So we, we, we will. We, and maybe we'll look at my hands too while we're at it. Well, <laughs> folks, thanks for joining us today on Dare to Dream. I hope you love the show as much as I did. Um, amazing human being doing amazing things. Please join us at LA Conscious Life Expo. You'll be so happy you did. I end the show today with this quote from Les Brown. In every day, there are 1,440 minutes. That means we have 1,440 daily opportunities to make a positive impact. Subscribe to the show, number one transformation conversation called Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. If you're listening on a podcast and you'd like to see us, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger or Spotify, where you can see us on video. Coming up in the next two weeks will be Shaman Durek Love this man, second sixth generation shaman and author of the best selling book, Spirit Hacking. Also, Neil Donald Walsh will be here with his new book. Thank you so much for joining us today. And remember everything that Robert said so important to consider what's right in the world, creating good karma, but mostly coming from a place of merits. How can we give and give? Because truly, we do receive when we do this. Thanks for joining us today.